Jordan, I, I wonder what you think about this proposition that's occurring to me while you're talking, which is that one of the great failures that we're, ex that we're experiencing in modern society obviously is a failure of conversation, that, that there's a difference between verbal and oral learning and just reading things. And that as we become a society where we don't talk to each other as much, that one of the things you lose about the narrative is the person who's telling you the narrative. That when your parent tells you a bedtime story, it's not just the bedtime story, it's that your parent is telling you the bedtime story. When you sit around the campfire and you abstract that larger story, it's the people who you're talking to, who you trust, to be good people who are telling you their various stories that allow you to abstract that out. And so as literacy has increased over the course of the world, that's allowed for the spread of knowledge, but it's also shallowed some of the some of the stories themselves because you sitting in a room reading the Bible is actually not the same thing as you sitting in a room with people discussing the Bible like we did during the Exodus seminar and getting various right, points right, of view right, and then abstracting right. out the lesson. And so as we move from a society that engages in conversation and oral learning, to a society that's very much about you and a device in front of you, or you and a book in front of you, or you and a TikTok video in front of you, that 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 isn't actually enough. That the, the form of tradition that we need to get back to is a form of oral learning and conversation, a sort of back and forth dialogue that allows us to actually understand the narratives in a powerful way. Otherwise, you do end up with the postmodern dilemma of, I'm sitting there and I'm reading a text that I just discovered and I'm bringing whatever my prior biases are, to that text. You actually do need a teller of the tale in order for you to fully understand what's going on well, with the you, tale. Well, you, well you, you point to a bunch of things there. So one is, okay, so let's blame some of this on the Protestants and their insistence that the biblical corpus per se is sufficient. Now, now one of the huge advantages of that was the promotion of literacy worldwide. So we're going to give the devil his due. But it, it does have the problem, that, the twofold problem that you just described. The first problem, Jung pointed to this, the first problem is that Protestant tends towards fractionation. And you can see that with the multiplicity of Protestant churches. Because if it's just you and the text, there's an infinite number of yous. And I think the logical extension of this are, is the identity claims that the radical types on the hedonic left are now putting forward, right? I'm the interpreter. I'm the only interpreter, right? It's between me and God and no one else. It's like, well, that's great unless you're deluded, in which case the God that you think you're following might not be God at all. Now, then you might say, well, how might I determine whether the God that's calling to me is God or Satan, let's say? And part of your answer is, you had a twofold answer. One is, well, is the story being told to you by people, actual embodied people, that you actually respect as a consequence of your knowledge of, let's say, their ethical conduct? And the other is, well, is there an active and living discussion around such issues that's conducted by a group of such people? Let's talk about staying healthy on the road. So we're on the road. We're in Poland. We just went to Auschwitz with, with Elon Musk. We spent a day filming. And producer Zach, he keeps healthy. How? Well, he uses his balance of nature, fruit and veggie capsules, when we are on the road, which is a smart thing to do. Balance of nature, fruits and veggies are a great way to make sure you are getting essential nutritional ingredients every single day. Balance of nature uses an advanced cold vacuum process that encapsulates fruits and veggies into whole food supplements without sacrificing their natural antioxidants. The capsules are completely void of additives, fillers, extracts, synthetics, pesticides, or added sugar. The only thing in Balance of Nature fruit and veggie capsules are, you know, like fruits and veggies. Right now, not only will my listeners get 35% off your first order, you'll get a free fiber and spice supplement as well. Balance of Nature fiber and spice supplement is a revolutionary fiber drink with a unique blend of 12 spices and whole foods. Experience Balance of Nature for yourself today. Go to balanceofnature.com, use promo code Shapiro, get 35% off your first order as a preferred customer, plus get a free bottle of fiber and spice. That's balanceofnature.com, promo code Shapiro, get 35% off your first preferred order, plus that free bottle of fiber and spice. You know, one of the things Pajot has helped me with a fair bit is understanding more deeply the role of ritual and congregation in the maintenance of social structure, but also in the transmission of the stories that, that need to be transmitted. As an academic type, and also as someone, let's say, as an intellectual prone to the temptations of the Luciferian intellect, it's very enticing for me to think that it can just be me in the text. But the problem with that is that you're blindest at your blindest spots. 
And you need that additional community to tap you out of your delusional self, delusional and unconscious, self-serving, atomistic individual individuality into something more like the universal space. And, you know, talk to Harris, Sam Harris recently, and Sam and I, and I suspect you as well, share a preoccupation with the reality of evil. And part of the reason that Sam beat the drum so hard for objective standards of morality grounded in science so an attempt to reduce the narrative to the objective was because he wanted to put a firm foundation under claims that there was a transcendent good, and the only way he could see to do that was through the empirical route. Now, you know, I've been looking at Robert Axelrod's work on the emergence of cooperation in iterated systems, and, and I think, so I think there actually is a place where the approach that Sam favors can be integrated with the sort of things that you and I and the Exodus participants, for example, have been discussing. So imagine that there's a landscape of repeated interactions. Let's say they're voluntary trades of information, of emotion, of goods. The voluntary part's important. And that across those trades, there's a pattern. Now, Axelrod showed in his computational sim simulations that if you and I were trading under certain conditions, the best strategy, the winning strategy in a competition of strategies would be for you and I to cooperate. But if you cheated for me to whack you with proportionate force and then to go back to cooperation, that, so that's tit for tat. Now, imagine that our lives are characterized by a sequence of repeated trades in multiple dimensions with multiple players in a game of indeterminate length and that there's a pattern of interaction that is optimal across that plethora of interactions. I think that the highest order narrative that grips us, so we'd find that compelling, that would be told by the people we admire, and that's in concordance with the biblical narrative, is a map of the strategy that works best in repeated interactions with multiple people across the broadest possible span of time. So that's a place where the empirical and the theological could reach perfect concordance. And, well, I I think the evidence points in that direction. Yeah, I, t I totally agree with, with all of that. And, and I also think that when, when you talk about, you know, the fact that the, these narratives have to be told to you by people that you trust, that people who you consider to be virtuous and all, all the rest of this. I think that even people who don't advocate for that understand it innately, which is why attacks on the church, for example, are never attacks on the Bible. Those are not effective attacks, right? The, the sort of attacks that you see from Richard Dawkins, for example, about the text of the Bible, that never has any impact on people who are truly religious because truly religious people exist within the context of religious communities. The most damaging thing to any institution is an attack on the people who comprise the institution and make the rules as non-virtuous and violative of the fundamental principles of that institution. This is why the attacks that have been most damaging to the Catholic Church have nothing to do with Catholic doctrine and everything to do with the activities inside the Catholic Church surrounding, for example, cover-ups of child molestation. It's why attacks on any institution are going to be the most telling based on taking people who you previously thought were virtuous advocates for the system and bringing them low and, and tearing them down. Are you tired of the lies and the twist of the mainstream media talking points? Yeah, me too. Join me in my newest series, Fact, where I dismantle and bring truth to this tiring mainstream agenda. <laughs> 